All right, so our next question is a, a combination giant, um, which is going to be, sorry, it was there. Um, what was your academic job search like? Meaning like, how did you find these opportunities? What advice would you have? And I think uh, putting in Sweetest nice twist, what advice, how would that advice maybe shift with COVID where things are more challenging to find these kind of opportunities? What advice might you have for someone that's currently on the job market um, based off of your own experiences or what you're seeing? So um, James, do you want to, I mean, we could do the raise hand thing because we're kind of running low on time. So does anyone want to tackle that question? James, look at that. This will just start. I'll take off <laughs> some of it. I, I don't know if I remember every component. Um, but I, I think the, the main thing, one thing about getting an academic job is we've got some standard things that we need to get and that's papers and grant money. I think we can't, we can't avoid that. So the more we can get those two things on our CV, the better. But then interviewing I found was actually like extremely important. The skill of interviewing, um, you know, once you got to that point where, you could, where, where people were interviewed, it's, it was then a matter of practicing. Um, and, you, and I personally had to practice this a lot. Um, I did a lot of Skype interviews, I would, um, up and, and they didn't go well, but afterwards I wrote down every question I was, I, I was asked and relived the interview till I could answer all of those questions with an anecdote from my life and experiences and things like that. So like I meticulously went about my interviewing skills to, um, and you, you just, and it takes practice. You just, for me, I found you just had to accept that it was, it was going to go badly at first, like that, that part. And it wasn't, it didn't mean that I wasn't necessarily up for the job. It was just like, this was another skill that I had to learn for that. So I'll answer that component and there's probably more in it, but I'll leave that to, to someone else. All right, Carolyn. I can probably add on. Um, I think, so the first um, application packages I put together, I sent to my mentors at the time and Chris Huber in particular, tore it apart. <laughs> I was very proud of what I had put together, but he told me, no, it doesn't work because a lot of the information you give here is something that they can already get from the metrics and from whatever. It's not what's interesting, it's what you've done and that everybody kind of knows or can get easily. What they want to know is what you can do, what you would do if you went to this position. How would you fit in? Why do you want to go to this place? Why do you want to contribute to this place? Why would you be the best person to have in this place to complement their team, to do the research in this region or to whatever? So what they want is a person, not, not just numbers. So they want a person who can fit in the department for its teaching, for its research, for its service. So, you know, what the, the team does as, as the group. And so I think that's something that really has to come out in your application package, in your cover letter and in your research statements. Um, it's not what you've done before and therefore what you think, but how, how would you put it? Can you give examples of research projects? You'd be very happy to set up there. And they have to be realistic, right? So you have to spend a lot of time searching the department, the region, understanding the geology of the region. What are the kinds of things that get funded? to a certain degree, obviously, but get some information. So they say, oh, wow, okay, this person knows what she's talking about, and I actually seduced by her ideas, and I could see myself working with this person. Um, so I think that's the message you have to give, whether it's in your application package or in your interview. Um, I've also learned a lot from um, hiring people in my team. And what I realized is what I, I, I can see from the paper right away if the person has a good pedigree or not. But what I cannot see, and that's why I need the interview, is will it be pleasant to interact with this person? Will it be easy to interact with this person? Will this person be able to communicate with other people in the team? Will they be able to adapt to Singapore and its way of working? And um, I ended up hiring a lot more on these soft skills than, than, than on the pedigree. And so it's really those soft skills, I think, that you have to try to be able to put out Cool. I think Mai also had something she wanted to share. At least your hands raised. Your yeah, yes. 
Um, I think a big part of it is to keep an open mind so um, and be flexible. So there was a lot of, there were definitely several instances in, uh, along my path where things, um, I, didn't, I didn't have a set expectation, right? I took what came my way and I tried to learn from it. Uh, and so if, if you go into something saying, I wanna do this and I wanna do this specifically, then you, you'll probably find it a bit more challenging to, to end up in a position that you enjoy. So if you stay open-minded, for instance, um, I'm gonna try teaching. I, did, I didn't know, I thought I would hate teaching. I loved it, I tried it, it's great. It's another skill that you get to acquire and you know how you feel about it. Uh, working with instruments, I didn't know if I would like it, if I'd be good at it. I was curious, I tried it, I liked it, that's awesome. So the more sort of different skills that you can acquire and figure out which skills you enjoy and would excel at, try to build on those skills and move forward. So don't just like find one narrow pathway and just try to keep an open mind. And I think that would, would help a lot. Cool. Um, well, we have another really cool question that I'd like to get to in that a couple of you, a lot of you have worked outside of academia, have other experiences in industry or volcano observatories. And the question is, was this useful for helping in your academic career? And would you consider non-academic careers in the future or you know, um, if you transitioned from your current position? So does anyone want to speak on? <laughs> I had a feeling you would. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, so definitely, yes. I feel that um, I said um, most of my training was in, in Mexico as, a, as the academic training, but the feeling for how to deal with the field, how to take decisions in the field, and a very important soft skill um, is also to learn how to interact with the communities living on the volcanoes that's something that you don't learn in lectures or in classes is a matter of practices and experiences of how you position yourself in an ethical way in the local communities working with the local communities instead of thinking that you're going to teach them something they they know more that, than we know all together so uh, that's something that only the practice and practice gives you and and uh, positions like in the geological surveys and especially the mapping exercises are beautiful trainers on, on how to learn um, to deal with the realities of the people which is not the academic reality sometimes we're when we are all involved in the academics it's like a part of universe and we only think about teaching and researching but life is so much more and and having that um practice in between and being closer to those areas keep working with them um even even thinking about going back there is a matter of opening that service to to a wide community the the people living actually on the volcano so I think it's very it's a, it's an amazing opportunity if you can switch from both from both uh, worlds. Oh, thanks. Does anyone else have suggestions on whether other experiences prepared you for your job outside of academia, or if you've ever thought about leaving academia to do a a non academic job? Yeah, James. Uh, well, yeah, just um, in terms of the experiences that I had working in industry, so I was an exploration geologist, um, mostly working on well sites, um, and a lot of it, well, half the time on well sites and half the time doing petrophysical reports and well reports. So I found it a super useful experience, mostly because of producing written products in short amount of time with hard deadlines. Um, I felt set me up a lot better for for academia in the sense that I was willing to write words really quickly um, which you know we, we can't take that for granted when it comes to trying to put papers together uh, and things like that um, I guess yeah I have considered yeah of course I've thought about not uh, life outside of academia like doing doing a postdoc um, with it with the year-to-year -year uncertainty um, definitely made me think about that um, so yeah I have uh, Sometimes I think I would just leave science altogether though if I were to do it because I really love 
being on the at this side of things in academia and i don't know if i could do wild reports ever again because that's so much fun doing research and and is so much more creative um but yeah that, that, that's me cool thank you i so i i don't have much experience outside of academia i kind of got sucked into it. I had no plans of necessarily being a volcanologist before suddenly I was one. Um, I think it, it more just happened because of research opportunities and I got really excited about the questions and the research and really driven by a desire to like understand what's around me, understand how those things form, um, understand the process that are you know both fascinating and, and worrying. Um, and um, so I, I just kind of got sucked into it um, but sometimes I, I do consider um, getting out of academia not because I'm not successful in what I do but more because I don't feel like I have enough time on what I actually really like on why I got here um, because because I'm spending so much time doing other things <laughs> than, than what I actually really like um, and also because I, I have a family with two young kids and very honestly, a job in an academic career is 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 more than a full time job. I mean it, and and it's very hard. I find sometimes to manage the work life balance, especially in the long term. So, um, I guess maybe what I want to say is is that it's important to kind of realize what you get yourself into. <laughs> and probably that's not as much. I, I didn't spend enough time really realizing that on 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 my side. So. I think um, following out what May was saying, trying out many things and see what you're good at and what you and what you what you enjoy doing is is probably good, so that you can see the different options you have. And there's not just one single stream taking you to being a professor, writing grants, supervising students, um, and doing research through its team instead of on their own. Um, so I think uh, being cr creative and and Getting back to the previous question about how COVID is going to affect things, in a way it's reducing the number of job opportunities, but in another it's also maybe up to us to create new jobs in this position. Because there, there are a number of activities that can't take place anymore, and I'm sure there's some creative minds that are going to find amazing replacements to those. Or maybe there's a lot more online teaching or online seminars that can be done that are not just for one university that could be services provided to a much grander um, group of people. Um, so um, I don't have any time for that and, and, and any need for that right now, but I think it's, it's a bit in the new generation's hands right now to, to find a new world. Yeah, thank you.